Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. And we have the discussion with Jesus Christ and Peter. And the other disciples were close by as well. In verse 18 of Matthew 16, we have this statement by our Lord and question. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I want to look at that verse in detail tonight. It seems like it's very easy, but there are some things that we need to take a look at. So just quickly look at the relationship of this verse as it relates to the church. Let's look at the obvious first. Jesus is talking to Peter. And he had just answered a question by the Lord Jesus Christ. And the question was, is, who do ye say that I am? That was the question. So Peter is going to answer the Lord Jesus Christ with this monumental statement. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Now that's obvious to us right there in the scripture. The second thing that we notice, it says upon this rock. And it is often referred to <coughs> Christ. <coughs> Contrary to those who believe, it refers to Peter. There are some people think that that rock, upon this rock, refers to Peter. But we believe that it refers to Christ. That's what we all commonly believe. Can I hear an amen? amen. <clears throat> now we're going to continue studying. So I know you already are, are settled on what the rock is. But we're going to continue our study. <clears throat> the obvious thing that I find here is that the church belongs to Christ because he's the object of the entire thought here. I will, I will build my church, so to speak. So the church belongs to Christ. That's obvious. By the way, I think we ought to remember that over and over again. This is not our church. This is his church. And we're just servants in his church. Is that right? Yeah. I'm glad I'm in the church. I'm glad I'm in Christ. And I'm glad I'm in his church. And there's another obvious thing. There's absolutely nothing that can tear down the church. Nothing. Do I hear an amen? There is nothing that can tear down the church. You say, I've seen churches torn up. But still, the gates of hell shall not prevail. means that nothing can prevail against the church. Can I hear a big amen? Man, that's something else. That's amazing. But upon this rock is the center of my thinking right now. I want to center in on upon this rock. Jesus said that. What did Jesus say? What did he mean? And why, why in the world did he ask the question? Uh, here, here's the point. Jesus is asking his disciples the question. Whom do men say that I am? In other words, Christ was saying the other people out there in the community, lost people, not necessarily believers like the disciples. Who do they say that I am? I wonder why Christ asked the question. I wonder if he was leading into something, and probably that's exactly what he was doing, uh, because he's going to make this wonderful statement, upon this rock I will build my church. So he was leading to that, I'm sure. So here's two or three possible things to learn from this one statement upon this rock. <clears throat> it could be the rock Jesus Christ. I'm just saying it could be at this point in time. The person of Christ is the head of the church, as stated by Paul in Ephesians 5.23 for the husband is the head of the wife, and as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. The confession of Peter, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, is a reference to the promised Messiah of the Old Testament, the deity of Christ, and the New Testament. 
The promises of the Old Testament are all fulfilled in Christ and Jesus who walked in the land of Palestine, was, promised, was the promised one, and also had the nature of God. Now, so you have two things there, you, two thoughts about upon this rock. The first one is, it's Jesus, which we commonly believe. And then another thought is, that is what Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. The confession of Peter. Some people believe that it was referring to Christ. Christ referred to himself upon this rock, upon me, I will build my church. And some believe it's the rock, what Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Great statement, wonderful statement. And others believe that that was the rock. And uh, so it brings up another, inter there's three. There's three interpretations of that upon this rock. You say, preacher, what difference does it make? Can I, can I give you a, a, an idea here? If this is what Christ said about the church, I think we need to pay attention to it. How many of you believe the church is very special to Christ? Amen. He gave himself for it. Loved the church so much he gave himself for it. The church is special to him. And when he said, upon this rock I'll build my church, he had something in mind, and I want to find out what it is. Some people think that uh, Jesus gave uh, Simon Peter the name Peter, a little rock, a stone, in John 1, 42, and he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. And so they think that this is referring to the little stone becoming a big stone, Peter. And that is a common interpretation, especially to some who believe in apostolic succession and some who believe in having popes. And they believe that Peter was the first pope. So those who believe that Peter was the first pope would believe that Christ is saying this little stone will be a big stone and so on. I thought about this, but Jesus didn't change any of the disciples' names very much. There's a few of them in there that, that had different variations but Peter is the one, uh, Simon, Simon. That means to hear, he who hears. He's, Simon, you're going to be a little stone, Peter. I'm going to change your name to Peter. Now, why in the world did the Lord pick Peter out of the 12 and say, I'm going to change your name? That gives credence to the idea that the Lord is giving Peter some special assignments. And he is in this passage of scripture. We're going to find out about that in just a little bit. So he did change his name. And that change of his name means that you are one who listens and you will be stable and firm and steadfast pillar, so to speak. So that's an idea that the Lord gave. And the Lord knew that when the new church started, at the day of Pentecost, by the way, I believe church started at Pentecost, don't you? And so when the Pentecost came, who was it that stood up and opened his mouth and really preached? Peter. And so as the church began to open up and bloom and blossom, so to speak, it was Peter that the Lord used. The rock, Peter. He used Peter. And it was known throughout all of the first century that it was Peter that was the head of the church at Jerusalem and then they later moved up to Antioch of Syria. And that's important to remember. So remember that little geographical detail. And we know that Peter went to other churches around him and the other churches that Paul had started accepted him as the leader of the church at Jerusalem. And we know that Peter would do great things for God, like uh, walking on water. Did any of the other disciples walk on water? Did any of them? Peter did. Peter did. And so Peter had some faith. Maybe it was weak, but at least he had some faith. And um, so Peter preached mightily. So he had faith, and he preached with uh, uh, conviction and power. And he preached to the Jews. And then he went and preached to the Gentiles. He was quite a preacher. 
So he, he opened the door of the church. He opened the door of the church to the Jews. And he opened, first of all, in at Pentecost. And then he opens the door, the Lord does through Peter. He opens the door of the church to those at Cornelius' house, Gentiles. So the Lord is using Peter in a mighty way in the opening of the church. And after we see what Peter preached and did, preaching became a fundamental tenet of the new church. The new church was known for preaching. Aren't you glad we still have preaching? Amen? I don't know about preachers, but I'm glad we still have preaching. <laughs> Amen. So anyway, he preached, and we still preach. So Albert Barnes, a fellow that I study after a lot, he says, this, upon this rock refers to Peter. I said, my goodness, Albert Barnes, I'm not, not, not so sure I'm going to read you anymore. You know, even good men can be wrong, can't they? Yes, they can. Is any man, any preacher, any scholar, any commentary perfect? Absolutely not. No, yeah, sure not. So, so we have three possible interpretations in front of us that have been debated and studied for years. The first one is that the rock refers to Jesus himself. The second one is that the rock refers to the confession of faith that Peter made. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And then the third interpretation, which is more common than we think, refers to Peter himself. Now, many of us have heard over the years the explanation of the two rocks. Peter's there, his name is Rock, and, and then there's a rock that Christ used. So we have the little play on words there. We have Peter's name means rock, which is a smaller rock. And then the rock that Christ used was a large rock, like called the cliff of a rock. And so we've heard that preached all our life. And we know about the little rock and the big rock. <clears throat> so many believe that Jesus used these two words, Petros, that's Peter. It's in the masculine gender. And Petra, which is the big rock, is in the feminine gender. To refer by implication to Jesus. In other words, Peter is the little rock and I'm the big rock. But I've got a question, but I'll come to it in just a minute. Of course, we know that the Roman Catholics use this verse to say that Christ built his church upon Peter and Peter visited Rome and was the first pope. That's what the Roman Catholics say. But that can readily be dismissed by the references to the areas of Peter's letter in 1 Peter. He talks about the people that he's sending this letter to are in Pontus, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, those are all the areas of Asia Minor, we call it. And uh, it is now the present-day country of Turkey. And so when Peter writes a letter, he's writing a letter to this group of churches over there where Ephesus was and all those places that Paul went to, uh, Galatians. That, the church at Galatia, and so on. So in that Asia Minor area, which is present-day Turkey, back then they called it Asia Minor, or Asia, simply Asia, but it's Asia Minor. And so that's a spot in Turkey from that, I think, at one of the Aegean Sea over to the end of the Mediterranean. That's Turkey. And so he's writing his letter to that spot. And as he writes the letter to those Jews in that spot, there's no indication in those five provinces of Anatolia, which was a Roman area with five provinces, Pontus, uh, Galatia, and uh, all the rest of those, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. All of those are five provinces of that place. And Bithynia is next to uh, Istanbul in Turkey. 
That's where basically. So Peter's writing to those Jews who migrated northwest, kind of, from Jerusalem or Antioch, probably from Antioch. Now remember, Antioch in Syria is not, it's, it's north of Jerusalem and it's in Syria, and Syria has a little pie shaped area between Turkey and Iraq. And over here, on this side of that little pie shape is the Tigris and the Euphrates River and Babylon's right over there. Not far from Antioch of Syria to the east would be Babylon. That's amazing. So he's writing to those churches and people in those five provinces, those dispersed Jews who had left Jerusalem because of persecution. And so when you think about Peter visiting Rome, there is no proof that he visited Rome. None. But the main thought is, what is Christ saying here about Peter and about himself? If Did Peter go to Rome? There is a reference, by the way, in uh, Second, I believe it's Second Peter, um, and it talks about Babylon. It says the Church of Babylon salutes you. That's the closing, I think, in Second Peter. I think it's three fifteen or something like that. And uh, he mentions the word Babylon, and all the commentators commentators to go to the Book of Revelation, and they say in the Book of Revelation, Babylon refers to Rome, and so Peter in his epistle is writing about Rome, not Babylon. But that's given Babylon a symbolic reference. And there's no proof that he was talking about Rome. Because if he was up in that area of Antioch of Syria, and he's writing to the churches over there in Turkey, it makes good sense that he wasn't far from Babylon. Some people believe he wrote First and Second Peter on the banks of the Euphrates. All I know is this. I believe Babylon means Babylon. I don't believe it means Rome at all. So there's no proof that Peter ever went to Rome, and there's no proof that Peter was the first pope of the church. Can I hear an amen? No proof whatsoever. You see, that's what people want you to think. But the, this, this is the idea. Our text is concerning the question by Christ. Whom do men say that I am? Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? That's what he said. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Christ liked the title, Son of Man. That's his favorite title for himself. And what he's referring to there is his humanity. Son of Man means I am human. Do you think Christ was pleased to be a human how many of you think he was pleased to be a human? One hundred. Do you know that they, the Bible tells me this, and we can go throughout the Bible and tell you this, but when he ascended up into heaven, got his new body, he still has a human body. In his resurrected form, he says, Thomas, look at the scars. Still had his own human body. It's a glorified body, but he still has a human body. He loves that title, Son of Man. Because he loves that the fact that he became human for the redemption of mankind. So the disciples answered him when he said, Who do men say that I am? The, who, who do men say that the Son of Man am? I, the Son of Man, am. He said, uh, The disciples answered him, said, This is in Matthew 16. And he says, uh, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So the people around Israel were saying, oh, there goes Elijah, or there goes Jeremiah, or there goes another prophet, or there goes uh, John the Baptist resurrected from the dead, something like that. So when the disciples gave this answer, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, so well, the Lord's not completely through with the questions. He's interviewing his disciples, and he wants to know what they think. That's important. 
In his mind, if I read this right in, in, in Christ's mind, he wants to know what his disciples, those who have believed in him, those who have followed him, he wants to know what they believe about him. And if Christ were here today, he would say to you and to me, who do you think I am? And it's an important question. And it has an important answer. So our Lord wanted to know their statement of faith. You know, we've got a statement of faith in our Constitution, and almost every church has a statement of faith. Aren't you glad we have a statement of faith that we believe the 66 books of the Bible, we believe in using King James Version of the Bible, we believe in the deity of Christ, and we believe in the uh, salvation of sinners by faith, through grace, by grace, through faith, and so on. And we believe in eternal security of the believer. Amen. We believe in baptism by immersion. How many of you glad you got a statement of faith around here? We got one. Yes. If you have never read it, we got it. And you can get plenty of them. They're all over. So what is your statement of faith about Christ? What do you believe about Christ? So when the disciple says, some say this and some say that, he said, whoa, guys. Who do you, whom do ye say that I am? What is your thoughts about it? I want to know what my followers think. What do you think? What is my relationship to you? What is my relationship to God? So Peter, who somehow or another had become a spokesman for the group, I'm not sure if it was because he always spoke up or that the Lord was using him in a special way. Maybe Peter had some leadership. I think he probably had some leadership abilities. I don't know who was leading the fishing tour and boats and all, the, all that business. I don't know who was leading it. But it was pretty amazing that Peter now comes along kind of second or third in the line of call of disciples, but he's the leader now of the group. And he speaks up. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I'm saying to myself, how in the world could an old raw-boned fisherman come up with such divine words? And Jesus gives me the answer. And Jesus said, flesh and blood didn't tell you that, Peter. That came from on high. Man, that came from heaven. Aren't you glad that Peter, Simon means listen. Aren't you glad he listened to that voice from heaven and spoke what he heard from heaven? The Holy Ghost, I believe, told him, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. How many of you believe those are divinely inspired words? Came straight from God. And Peter had enough gumption to just let her rip. He came out with it. And when he says, thou art the Christ, he said, you're the Messiah that is promised in the Old Testament. You're the anointed one of God that has been promised from ages and ages. You're him. You're the one promised by the prophets. You're the one spoken of by Moses. You're that anointed of God. And then when he says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, he said, son means that you have the very nature of God. He's saying, you're the promised Christ, the anointed one of the Old Testament, and you're of, the, even though the New Testament's not written, you are the Son, you're the very nature of God himself. The Son has the idea of nature. So he's got it right. He's the God of the, Jesus is the God of the Scriptures. He is the anointed of the Old Testament and so on. And so his very essence, Peter is uh, announcing or pronouncing, however you want to say it. So he, Jesus says, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? He said, the son of man is Christ and the son of the living God. So you put all that together, son of man, you got the humanity of Christ. The son of the living God, you got the deity of Christ. So you've got two things in that whole idea here. You've got the humanity of Christ and his perfection, and you've got the deity of Christ and all the perfection of the Godhead. Man, that's a whole lot of words. 
That's, how many of you know that's a powerful confession? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Is that a monumental statement? Is it? Monumental. It is the biggest statement, I think, probably in the Word of God. But now that is going to relate to the church because Christ puts that in perspective with the new church that is getting ready to burst forth. The mystery that had formerly been hidden is now getting ready to be revealed. And so Christ says upon this rock in the feminine gender, Petra. I think somebody has been to Petra. Bob, you been to Petra? Is that a big rock? It's a lot of rocks, isn't it? Yeah, a lot of rocks. Petra is a lot of rocks. So here is Petra, feminine gender. Would Christ refer to himself in the feminine gender? Upon this Petra, feminine. It is my interpretation that Christ would not have referred to himself in the feminine gender. If he had referred to himself, he would have used Petro or Petros. Peter was Petros. He would have used Petros. That, but that's a little rock. And he said upon this rock, and it's singular. So he, he would have used a different form. So we don't have the masculine and gender, feminine gender in words like that. Sometimes we do, but we say she. We refer to a ship as a she. We refer to a city as a she. In other words, other objects we refer to as a, in the feminine. And Christ is referring to, in my opinion, the confession of Peter. Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He says, upon this rock, the confess Petra, feminine, I will build my church. Now you say, but, 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 but wait just a minute. If that confession says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, doesn't it also refer to Christ? It does, doesn't it? You can't get by with this confession saying thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's a great confession. But its basic object is Jesus Christ. So I could say with very safe uh, interpretation, I could say confession and Christ. Because Christ is the object of the confession. So I'm not going to quibble with anybody. But I know it doesn't stand for Peter. The, upon this rock does not stand for Peter. Can I hear a good amen? But it could refer to the confession of faith made by Peter. So Jesus says that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now let me say this. If... You don't get anything else. Get this. The deity of Christ, the humanity of Christ, the deity of Christ is a foundation for the church. That's a foundation. If you take away the deity of Christ, which a lot of people have done in these liberal universities and so on, liberal seminaries, if you take away the deity of Christ and the perfect humanity of Christ, you've destroyed the foundation of the church. Amen. And Jesus himself is called the cornerstone. I wish I could sing that song. Man, I like that one. And then he says to Peter, now listen to what he does. This is what he does give Peter. He says in verse 19, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. See, I believe he'd been referring to Peter before he wouldn't have said this. Now he's referring to Peter. He brings Peter into the picture now. And he says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do for you, Peter. And I will give unto thee the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, i got, I got a question for all of you. If some ignoramus came along and said, 
And I want to ask you something. Mark, Matthew 16, 19 says, what's ever bound in heaven, you can be bound. Do, do you believe that the church can bind this one and loose this one from this or that or the other thing? In other words, if somebody asks you, what is this binding and loosing of the church? If somebody asks you, what are the keys to the kingdom? I don't know, preacher. I really don't know. Well, I'll be honest with you. I think we better get this straight in our mind. And I believe here it is. <clears throat> the question should arise, what are the key, keys to the kingdom of heaven? And what is this binding and loosing referring? Our Lord in verse 16 is identified as God himself. In verse 18, he's the builder or architect of the church I will build. In verse 19, he's the doorkeeper of the future church. Do you remember that passage in the book of Psalms, Psalms 84, 10, which states that for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand, and I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. And of course we know that Jesus claimed to be the door. In John 10, 7, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. And in verse 9 of the same chapter, he says explicitly, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Jesus is the door, doorkeeper, and he has the keys to the door, the kingdom of heaven. Now, I believe salvation is in view. There is no other way to get to heaven except by salvation. Amen? Amen. No other way. So salvation, he's going to give Peter the key of salvation. I, I believe that's what it's talking about. So what happened at Pentecost? Thousands got saved. Is that right? So Peter had this message that went forth. And when you read that message in Acts chapter 2 and so on, you say, he really didn't say that much uh, as far as the gospel, but people turned to Christ by the thousands after Peter's sermon. Power of the Holy Spirit was doing some work. Can I hear an amen right there? I'm glad. I wish the Holy Spirit would do more work, and I wish we would obey him more, and I wish we'd be more submitted to him. I wish we'd be more filled with the Holy Spirit. We'd see more salvation, right? More salvation. How many of you know we need to see more salvation? We do. We do. So Peter's given that key, I believe. And doubtless, it worked. So he goes to Jerusalem and preaches. He goes to Cornelius and preaches. And salvation is, is going on all the time there. So I believe that he has been made, Peter had been made an instrument of opening the door of salvation to many people. Many people. I don't know about you, but if the Lord gave Peter the opportunity to open the door of salvation, I believe in some way, maybe not in the same way that Peter had it, we all have the open door of salvation to other people. You can open the door of salvation to other people. I can open the door of salvation to other people. If the Lord gave human Peter the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And he opened the doors of salvation to many people. I believe it's not just for Peter. I believe everybody here has also some keys to the door of salvation. How many of us know how to be saved? There's the key. There's the key. All you got to do is use the key. Is that right? Just use the key. All right, so... <clears throat> So uh, some people think that uh, that this, how many of you have ever heard this? I got to quit. I, I, I love preaching. I know y'all got to go. I know everybody's going to go. But how many of you ever heard jokes about Peter at the pearly gates? Anybody? Peter's at the pearly gates. This is where they get it from. They think they, that Peter's got the keys to the gates of heaven, a literal gate, and that he stands up there at the door uh, gates of heaven at the pearly gates and he opens and closes the door and we've heard thousands of jokes like that and they get it from this verse how many of you know that's ridiculous that's absolutely ridiculous there's no peter standing up there at the pearly gates letting people in or out that that's just not the way it is or put them out. but we do know this peter was the foundation of the new church 
was not the foundation of the new church. Christ was. Nor was he the doorkeeper. Christ was the doorkeeper. But surely Peter was used in a miraculous way to begin the new church. And then there's that binding and loosening. And I'm got I'm going to bind and loosen right quick. What is that talking about? Some people believe it means praying. If any two of you, three of you shall agree on, two of you shall agree on one thing, it shall be done, so on. That's what some people believe. But can I give you this thought? I want to give you a thought. The church has the responsibility. This is talking about the church. The church has a responsibility to make its doctrines according to the word of God like they should be. In other words, we set down a doctrine. We believe in the deity of Christ. We believe in the verbal inspiration of the Bible. Some people call that laws. Some people call it rules. And by the way, what are laws and rules for? They are to bind us together. Aren't you glad we have doctrine to bind us together in a church? And aren't you glad that there's some doctrines that we don't hold to, like the doctrine of tongues, and we loosen that doctrine and say, nope, we don't take that one. The church has the direct responsibility from Jesus Christ to bind certain doctrines, laws, rules, whatever you want to call them, and to loosen certain things. And we are responsible to set those doctrines plainly and clearly, and the church has the power to do that. Amen. Aren't you glad we have doctrines? Aren't you glad we got a statement of faith, constitution, etc.? The church has the power to bind and to loosen. Let's pray.